Hello respective viewers, I'm George from Ireland, so welcome back to my Lord channel. Um, now I'm going to be talking about the difference between joint tenancy and tenancy in common. Um, so there used to be different other, other different ways of, of, of sharing um, uh, land ownership. So a joint tenancy and tenancy in common are the only major forms of co-ownership uh, still around today. Um, now there's a big difference to them. Um, Dunbar against Plant 1998 is a case which really crystallises this. Um, so remember that in the case of a joint tenancy, the last one alive has everything and he or she can pass it on to others. Um, so that's the right of survivorship. Whereas in tenancy in common, there are separate shares. Supposing it's just two of them, um, one of these people can sell out his or her share, sell it to the other person, give it away to somebody, put it in his or her will. Uh, or even though it's not spatially divided, the land is, is, is um, financially divided. If the house or the land was sold, the money would be divided in those shares. Um, and um, it's an tenants in common don't have to have equal shares. One person can own a quarter, the other could own three quarters, for instance. They can have equal shares, and often they do. Um, it could be between two people, three people, four people, more even. Um, all right. So uh, in equity, you could co-own land um, either through a joint tenancy or tenancy in common. But in law, you can only do it through joint tenancy. And why is that? Is that this is a practical reason. Prior to 1925, land could be legally co-owned either through tenancy uh, in common or a joint tenancy, um, a personality, as we now say. But anyway, as we've seen, tenancy in common, um, uh, there's no unity of title. So that means that the tenants in common might have different titles, different title deeds, different documents. So anyone who's ever purchased a house will be aware that um, investigating title is very time consuming and pricey. So in order to make it more straightforward and streamline um, conveyancing, the 1925 law said legal co-ownership can only uh, co um, uh, is limited to joint tenancies only. All right, so there's only one legal title to investigate. And so the maximum number of legal joint owners is four. That's just for the trustee Act 1925. And to simplify it even more, uh, the complication of, of dealing with uh, legal title is as dealt with um, in sections 30, 34 and 35 of the Law of Property Act 1925. If the legal title is conveyed to more than four co-owners or tenancy in common, it will simply be seen as a legal joint tenancy with four legal owners maximum in the conveyance as per section 34 of the LPA 1925. So that means dealing with legal title is a lot easier, but it's inflexible because there might be more than four people who got an interest in the land and they don't want to be bound by the right of survivorship. So the co-owners might not want their interest to be held through joint tenancy. To make um, conveyancing faster and easier, they might want an element of flexibility. The 1925 law, um, therefore, uh, made it simple. Um, and it was, uh, they, they invented this, this little trick what they did is they would impose a trust of land where it was co-owned. So this um, was able to deal with sort of anomalous situation, making it simpler how to, how to deal with a legal title um, by saying that there are limits on how um, it can be held. So this uh, means that it's still flexible um, about the beneficial interest because it allows the equitable trust interest to be held either through joint tenancy or through tenants in common. Um, and there has therefore has no limit to the number of people who are beneficial owners. So there've got to be the four unities as we know. So um, uh, are the co-owners, co are they joint tenants or tenants in common? Well, you have to ask yourself a number of questions. First of all, are the four unities there? If they're not, they can only be joint tenants. They're, sorry, they cannot be a joint tenancy. They can only be tenants in common. Remember the four unities, the unity of title, the unity of time, the unity of interest, and the unity of possession. So the unity of title, that's to say that all the co-owners get their interest from the same document or the same action. Um, secondly, unity of time, that they all um, receive them at the same time. Um, unity of interest means that all the co-owners have the same interest in land. That's free freehold estate, for example. There could be others. Unity possession means that each co-owner um, owns uh, the whole of the, the land. They don't own, they can't, um, one owns um, a quarter and the other owns a third and the other owns the rest or something like that. Um, no. Uh, they don't all own the whole thing. They don't have separate shares of it because remember it's a right of survivorship. The last one alive is going to own the whole of it. So um, as you will have seen, the unity of possession uh, means it is vital for tenancy in common. So a co-owner who's not in occupation is usually not entitled to claim the occupation from um, rent from a co-owner in occupation. 
but this is dealt with by sections 12 and 13 of Talata 1996. And there are a few exemptions. Um, uh, for instance, if the four unities are not there, there can be no joint tenancy. But a tenancy common requires only a unity of possession. You don't need the other three. Um, if there are any words of severance in the grant um, showing that the tenants uh, can take it as tenants in common, okay, there's a situation whereby equity presumes tenancy in common. Well, there's the principle of the uh, joint tenancy is sensible if you view it as something similar to a marriage, but could be more than two people in the marriage. So um, in, in um, uh, Christian marriage, they were joined together, said to be one flesh, as per the book of Genesis. So the two people are treated as a single person in the presence of God. So joint tenancy is the same idea. that The cohabitants um, have unified rights, and these cannot be separated. Um, so it comes into existence at the same time through the same rights, just like if a spouse dies, usually the surviving sp spouse uh, would own everything. Um, okay, uh, so it comes into possession at the same time. These rights, they cannot be divided unless you go through a procedure called severance. Like a married couple, they're treated as, as a, a single entity unless there's a divorce or indeed their marriage is broken through death. Um, so look at this, you, it's important to pick out whether there's a joint tenancy and whether severance has occurred or not. So how can you acquire equitable interest in a home? So the law about the acquisition of equitable interest in a house is called trust of homes usually, and there are situations where co cohabitation of a property and cohabitants are arguing about whether their rights in property and the size and nature of their rights what they are. And this is one of the thorniest areas of law, but some people find it uh, gripping. The subject matter of these cases um, is, is sometimes simple to comprehend. Um, the relationship breakdowns, so cohabitants um, will, be, will be trying to fight off mortgage lenders who are trying to repossess the property. Now, there are other predicaments in where claimants argue that it's unconscionable for them to um, be deprived of rights in their home. So there are plenty of cases in this area, and um, they, tend, they tend to sort of sharply disagree with each other, so it's very discombobulating. So the um, approach that's taken here um, is, is mainly guided by the Supreme Court in Jones and Kernot, 2011. And so that's a leading case. Uh, the ruling here doesn't um, overrule previous cases. So we just have to see the trends of previous cases and to see how Jones, Jones and Kernot would be uh, as applicable in subsequent cases. The Supreme Court heard Jones and Kernot and they tried to offer an explication of the prior decision in Stack and Dowd in 2007, which is also an important case. So the approach was um, published in the ruling of um, Lady Hale of Richmond, then present Supreme Court, she's since retired, and Lord Walker, um, because they, they sat on, on Jones and Kernot. So this is perhaps the most cogent um, one in this uh, very vexed area of the law. So it's said that this is the approach and the structure you should look at. So if the property is registered in the name of one person. The presumption is that this person is the sole equitable owner. But if the property is registered in the name of more than one person, then it's presumed that those people are equitable co-owners of the property. But these presumptions are rebuttable if you can identify um, and some different common intention of the parties concerned. So the common intention could be inferred from the situation, but it has to be done so in an objective manner. So there's this notion of common intention. Um, so this was hotly disputed in previous case law, and the earlier case law is, is vital in this area. So um, it's very contentious. Uh, in trying to find um, common intention, um, you might not be able to do so. The court might um, rule on, on what they consider is fair, having regard to all the circumstances of the case. So um, it's uh, crucial here. The message um, is a, a tripartite layout. So uh, you've always got to think... Um, was what was the party's common intention if you can find one at all um, look at previous case law how does that pertain to any cases that you're analyzing and um, uh, if, if uh, you can't find any clear common intention what would be fair having regard to the circumstances toodaloo